Morning, everybody. Welcome to Papa Lim Physics Classroom. Okay, today we'll be going through uh, another school prelim paper for the set four uh, normal cat. Okay, the paper I've chosen is Palema Melody's Girl School. Okay, it's a two zero two one paper. Okay, so you have same as the usual uh the, the other paper. Okay, if you have not gotten the paper, okay, I have opened up the link. I have uploaded a file to the to my Google Drive. The link is in the description panel below. Okay, feel free to go in and download and give a try for on the paper. Okay, so if you've done it, okay, we will go through the paper uh, one by one, same as before. If you just need a certain question, paper two, question two, or some other questions, okay, remember drag the video to the to the respective timing and just get what you need. After that, uh, focus on what on the thinking process of solving the question, okay, rather than on the answer itself. Okay, because if you watch the whole video, just uh, just just watching it, uh, is is is. I would say it's a one hour plus video, so it will be quite boring actually. Okay, so only get what you need. Okay, if you need certain MCQ question, just direct directly to that particular question. Okay, but importantly, no matter what, uh, which uh method you do, what paper you are doing, okay, for all subjects, okay, the important thing is not the answer, it's about the thinking process. Okay, with the correct thinking process, you will definitely get the answer correct every time. Okay, the thinking process is more important. Okay, we are delaying. Okay, we will look at the paper for this particular video. Okay, 2021, Pileba Mary's Girl School, prelim paper for set four normal cat. Okay, if you have done the paper, okay, you might want to pause here so that you can go through the answers uh, that you have in that they've done. Okay, so that you can actually look at uh, what are the mistakes or what are the careless mistakes, what are the gaps that you have in your revisions. Okay, now you might want to pause it to check your answers. Okay, if you have done it, Okay, we will move right down to each of the questions to look at what are the common misunderstandings or what are the common pattern the question can be can be uh, can, can be dealt with lah. Now, question one here we're looking at the oscillations. Okay, now oscillations. If you look at uh pendulum, uh, one of the few things that we, I always remind students is to look at how you calculate as one oscillation. So for one oscillation. Okay, usually what we what I tell students is to look to how to look for the smiley face in the oscillations to identify one, one oscillation. Example, if I start from left-hand corner, so yeah, I'm going to let it swing, okay, the, the pendulum will be swinging from left to right. So he will be swinging from left to right, he will end up, or I would say to be swinging left, center, after that, right. Okay, then after that, so how do you count one oscillation? Okay, give me a minute, it should be higher up. Okay, how do you identify one oscillation? Remember, it's always from the, let's say one corner, I always tell students to look for the smiley face. Okay, now what you do is trace the motion first. It will be left, center, right. After that, you will come back, okay, center, left again. Okay, so the motion that you will see is always left, center, right. Okay, left, center, right, then after back to center, then back to left. If you trace the motion, you will find that there's this smiley face that will appear. Okay, this smiley face is actually what I always tell students is what we call the one oscillation. So the time to complete this oscillation is what is, is what we know as the period. The same thing as before, if you start from the center, okay, always look for the smiley face. Huh? So if you start from the center, it will be center, right, after that left, center, okay, to the left. Then after that, you will go back to center again. So if you trace the motion, for example, if I start from the center again, okay, you will be going to the right, left, you will be going to the center again, you will be going to the left, then back to the center again. So at any one time, if you trace the complete motion, you will actually see this smiling face appearing. Okay, this smiling face is what we call, what we, what we term it as one oscillations. And the time taken for this one oscillation is also known as the period. Then the other two things that I always remind students is other than oscillations, okay, we also need to know that the period of the pendulum okay, always depends on two factors. It depends on the length of the pendulum and the location of where you conduct that particular uh, pendulum experiment. For example, if you are looking at longer length, the longer the length of the pendulum, the higher, the longer is the period. You'll take more time to swing. 
Same thing is if you look at the planet Earth. On planet Earth, your gravitational field strength is 10 newton per second uh, per kg. If you go to moon, okay, a place whereby the gravitational field strength is lower, okay, the gravitational field strength is lower, well, you'll find that the time taken to swing the oscillation will also take a longer time. So when you look at the two factors, the longer the length or the smaller the gravitational field strength, you'll find that the time taken for one oscillation will actually be much, much higher. Okay, so take note of the two factors that will affect the period. And after that, take note of what we term it as one oscillations. Okay, with this, you actually can look at the question here. Okay, which of the, the pendulum is two, sec, uh, two second? Okay, so two second means you have basically what we know as one half a cycle is one second. Okay, so a quarter cycle will be a quarter cycle will be 0.5 seconds. Okay, it will be quarter cycle with 0.5 seconds. Okay, so if I start from where, okay, it, it vertically he moved to the right first, huh? he moved to the right as shown. So if you look at the pendulum, he's, okay, when it's vertical, it's moving to the right. Okay. So what we are looking at is, let's say if I start from here, remember uh, every quarter second cycle is 0.5 seconds, or what we call every cycle is 2 seconds. Huh? So what we are looking at is, let's look at the swinging. So you start to the right, so you will be right side 0 0.5 second. Okay, so this will be 0 0.5 seconds. Then after that, back again to the center, 0 0.5. Back again, okay. So this will be another 0 0.5. After that, you will be back again to be another 0 0.5. So you're looking at two seconds for this one oscillations. After that, from here, I will carry on to have another 0.5 seconds to the right. Okay, so it will be 2.5. Then after that, you will be back again. It will be 3 seconds. After that, you will be back here again, another 0.5 seconds. So at this position, it will be at 3.5 seconds. Okay, so if you trace the motion, you'll find that at 3.5 seconds, the pendulum is actually on the left side. So that's why I know the answer will be on the will be A. Okay. Now, same thing is same. Right? The uh, question two is on your measurements. Okay, here the trick here is the question is asking for the radius of radius of each sphere. So there's two tricks that is looking at. Okay, the question is give give you seven identical sphere. So what he's looking at, he's looking for one sphere. Okay, so you must remember that whatever measurement you see here. Okay, first step you must divide by seven. Okay, the first step divide by seven. This will give you the diameter of one sphere. Okay, so you will give you the diameter of one sphere. Then after that, the question asks for radius. So you don't just stop at dividing by seven to get the diameter. So what you do is the second step, you still need to divide by two. Why? Because diameter is actually twice the radius. So if you've done this, if you've done this, okay, you look at the uh, measurements, you'll be able to identify the question, answer here to be 3.5 cm. Okay, take notes. Okay, if you want to look at the overall length, okay, it will be from one corner to the other corner. Okay, so you look at the difference between the two length, two, two locations, you'll be able to find the length. Once you identify the length, okay, remember divide by seven first, then divide by two again, okay, to find the time, uh, radius. Okay, so I would say it's quite straightforward. Nothing fanciful. Just be careful okay, of what the question is asking for. Okay, especially that radius, diameter, all these things. Okay. Now the 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 question question three here to get the displacement. Now displacement is always from it's always about the shortest distance between the start and end point. So this is what we mean by displacement. Okay, the shortest distance between start and end okay now this is what happened okay so for in this case the question say i start from p so this is my starting point p after that the question say what's the displacement of the car when it reaches point r so my r will be what we know as my end point my end point so this will be my r so the shortest distance between the start and end point it will be the straight line between them. That will be the shortest line, okay? 
So between these two points, okay, the star and the N, okay, this will be my the shorter distance between the star and the end point. So when we talk about displacement between the start and end point, displacement between start and end point between P and R, this is what we what we are looking for. Okay. The displacement, which means what we are looking for is actually the hypotenuse of this triangle. Of this right angle triangle, we are looking specifically at the right, the hypotenuse of this right angle triangle. So the displacement or what we call the the, hypot uh, the hypotenuse will be what uh, by Pythagoras theorem a square plus b square. So it will be the displacement. Okay, it will be a square plus b square, five square plus three square. After you remember the square roots. And this will give you an answer to be 5.8 kilometer. Okay, so this is what we mean by your displacement, the shorter distance between the start and end point. And remember, in this question, we actually use Pythagoras theorem. Okay, so take note of your math. Huh? Okay. Now, net force, which of the statement is incorrect? Question four. Okay, which of the statement is incorrect? Here, take note. Okay, when we talk about net force, okay, net force, net force, which of the incorrect? Huh? So when, when you have a net force is zero. Okay, to keep the object moving at uniform velocity, definitely. Okay, when we talk about uniform velocity, we means A equal to zero. Okay, so which means you don't need uh, the net force on acting on the ob object when you have zero, when you have zero acceleration or what you call uniform velocity, it will mean that the net force is actually zero. Okay, then after that, what happens is you look at a net force is needed. Okay, so a net force needed to keep the object from moving with uniform velocity. Now, same thing, actually this statement is actually a contradiction. If D is correct, C will be wrong. Or vice versa, C correct, D wrong. So if you look at it carefully, it's like uh, when you're talking about uni uh, same as option D, uniform velocity, it means acceleration is A equal to zero. It also means that the F net is zero. So when D is correct, automatically it will, it will say that C will be wrong. Because a net force has zero, okay, is zero when you are looking at uniform velocity. So automatic the answer will be C straight away. Now for question five, okay, your wheel move uh moving keyword here we're looking at for is driven by engine. Okay, oh take, sorry, driven by engine. Okay, when you talk about driven by engine and walking, okay, walking driven by engines, we are looking at one of the type of one type of friction known as your forward friction. Okay, this friction, the direction of this friction actually accounts for your moving direction. So let's say if the accession of a car is moving to the right, if this is the front wheel driven by the engine, the friction for by the on sorry, the friction on the wheel okay, will be in the same direction as the traveling. Okay, so this is what we mean by forward friction. We okay, mean the forward friction, the friction acting on the wheel will actually detect, will detect the direction of the car. Okay, when we talk about if what happens when I say the wheels, the wheel is what we call your back wheel. Okay, which is not attached to the engine. If it's not attached to engine, not attached to engine, you'll find that in this case the back wheel is being dragged. Okay, experience a dragging. So the friction will be will be in the in the direction that is opposite to the direction of travel. So if your wheel is the back wheel, okay, you'll find that friction. Direction of friction is actually option D. Okay, but if the friction is but if the wheel is a forward friction, or example, the wheel is attached to the engine, the wheel will definitely experience a forward friction, and the answer here will be B. Okay, so note what you are uh, what type of friction you are looking at, whether it's forward friction or backward friction. Huh? Now density, density of the go bar, okay, when a whole of two cm depth. Okay, hold on, a hole depth and cross sectional area is 2 cm cube is drilled into the bar. Okay, okay. Now, so when you talk about the drilling here, is I drill the hole of a certain depth, okay, of certain volume. So it's so called it's like the, the volume and the volume and cross sectional area is actually is, is, is I will not say it's random, but it's actually predicted. Okay, so we are for that particular volume for the particular depth of the uh hole, okay, a certain amount of mass of the goal will actually be drew off. But one thing that we need to take note is that whether it's the goal cylinder okay, that is being drew off okay, versus the original goal bar, okay, whether it's the original bar, as long as the two of them are the same material, the density 
of the bar will actually remain the same. So that's why the bar and the drill, the, the hole that's been drilled out, both of them are gold. Okay, both of them will have the same density of 19 gram per cm cube. Okay, so you can get your answer straight away without calculation because both of them are the same material. Okay, and there's no forces acting on them. Okay, so that's why it's known as uh, both of them have, will have the same density, which is 19 gram per cm cube. Now, what is the work done against question C? What's the work done against uh, gravity? Okay, against gravity here, take note work done. There's two segments you can work done is considered. Work done is controlled by the formula force times distance move in the direction of the force. The question mentioned about gravity. Okay, the force that deal with gravity here, what we are looking for is actually the weight. And in this case, the weight is actually pointing downwards. The weight is pointing pointing downwards. Okay, so if you're the force is going downwards, okay. If you're looking at work done, if you're looking at work done, the force is downward, it will mean that the distance that you're of interest has also to be in the same axis, which has to be in a vertical direction. So you'll find that the only distance that's in the vertical direction during this motion up the slope, vertical also, it has to be the vertical height, which is two meter. Okay, so if the weight of the object, remember weight, uh, weight is mg. Height is 2 meter. Mass is 25 kg. Gravitational field strength is 10 newton per kg. So it will be 250 multiplied by 2. So it will be an uh, answer of 1000 joules. Okay. Done. Okay. For against friction. Okay. Now, here, let's take a look. Okay, oops, oh, I made a calculation error. Okay, 250 times two is not 1,000, it's actually 500. 500 joules, my mistake, huh? Oh, need to use a calculator. Okay, so it actually should not be C, it actually should be B. Okay, take note of the calculation. Huh? Now for question eight, question eight will revolve around the uh, kinetic model of what's on the molecular uh, structure. Okay, the volume of gas is heated. Okay, when heated increases. Okay, much more than solid and liquid. This is what we know as your object when it's heated, it expands. Huh? So why, why is it the volume expands more? Okay, the primary reason between the differences between solid and liquid and gas in this perspective is that gas will have actually the weakest intermolecular attraction. So with the weakest intermolecular attraction, if I given you, if I give, if I input the same amount of energy, my particle actually can move. Okay, the fastest because the bond is the intermolecular force is uh, weaker in gas, and as a result of this increase in motion, increase in vibration, this movement, okay, the gas will actually expand at a greater rate as compared to the solid and liquid. Okay, primary reason is because of the attraction force between the uh, molecule in the gas. Okay, with a weak intermolecular bonds, okay, your molecules can actually move about okay, at a bigger space. Question 10, okay, you look at the copper box is filled with cold water. Huh? So this is cold. Okay, so, and after the surface outside is coated at different uh, texture, different color, okay, you'll find that what happened, which of the section will absorb the least heat okay, by radiation. Huh? So if you look at radiation here, we are looking at your texture, shiny versus dull. You're looking at your surface area. Okay, the bigger the better, the bigger the area, the more radiation uh, being absorbed. Then we're looking at the temperature of the surfaces. Okay, the higher the temperature, oh sorry, to be exact, so the bigger the differences in the temperature between you, the body and the environment, the bigger is the radiation absorption. Then after that, followed by the color. Color here will of course be that black will be a better absorber as compared to white. So if I want the texture to be, if I want the surface to be least less least radiation being absorbed so i'm looking at the texture here it should be shiny it should be reflective so that i prevent heat from being absorbed surface area i will want to be as small as possible temperature i want the difference to be the change the difference in temperature to be as small as possible so if i want the radiation absorption to be as small as possible the least amount i will i want to want to make sure that color i use would be actually be white Okay, so this will be the factor that I'm looking at if I want to identify the area with the least absorptions. Okay, so true enough, you take a look for, if I need to be 
texture has to be shiny. So which means shiny, these two surfaces will win trump over the other two section. So, and I also, and both all the surfaces are actually the same size. So surface here is not an issue here. Temperature differences. Okay, since it's the same cold water, it's being filled with icy water, the, all the four, all the four areas will have the same temperature difference. So this will not be a factor. The other factor that we are looking at is the color. Okay, so the black, the white, okay, these are the color. So the white being the worst uh, radiate, uh, absorption. Okay, so white would be the chosen choice if I want to have the surface with the least radiation absorbed. So that's why it will be shiny and white. Okay, so that's why the answer here will be C. Okay, so here we're looking at your uh, conduct convex radiation. We're looking at radiation particularly, and we actually look at the factors affecting radiation. Okay, so students, you have to know what are the factors that's affecting. Question 11, longitudinal wave. Okay, longitudinal wave, definition of the wave motion, which is incorrect, uh, which is incorrect. Okay, so if you look at it, is that the first, the most obvious one would be actually option D. Standard definition for wave motion, one of the property of wave motion is you are able to actually transmit energy without the motion, without the motion of the matter itself. Okay, so what we are looking at is the, the matter, which is the example, it could be air. So the air molecule, when I transmit uh, sound, when I transmit sound or when I transmit a uh, transverse wave, okay, any waves, you find that the particle is only vibrating about its position in a certain direction. The particle actually remains the same. The matter actually remains where they are. They are not moving. Okay, so the matter is, is not being transmitted. So among these, uh, among these four options, you'll find that the most obvious one will be D, okay, which is why D will be the chosen answer. Reflection, refraction, displacement time graph. Remember whether it's longitudinal, whether it's long, uh, whether it's uh, longitudinal or not, or transverse wave, all the waves can be okay, can be represented using displacement distance graph. Longitudinal wave has refraction and compression, definitely. Okay, and same thing, transverse wave okay, can be categorized by tress and trout depending on what, what, are the, what is the graph that is given. Okay, so definitely it's correct. So ABC is correct. So you leave us with D okay, being the wrong answer. Same thing uh, as before, uh, water wave. Here, water wave and the motion is going to the left. Water wave here, the clue that students are, uh, he's trying to tell you is the direction has to be, okay, it's a transverse wave. Okay, and with transverse wave, we are looking at the particle vibrating in perpendicularly to the wave motion. So perpendicular means the option can be B or D. Okay, so the possible option could be B and D. Machine straight away A and C is out already. Yeah? Okay, so things to take note, water wave is transverse wave. Okay, so you will know which of the motion we are looking at. So we will narrow down to B and D already. Now, so we are able to narrow down to B and D. So how do we identify whether B or D is the correct answer? Now, for the identifying the motion of the wave, okay, motion of particles in the transverse wave, the technique is always the same. Okay, so this is, this is how it, it is going to do. So we know that the wave motion is going to the left. Okay, so what we do is we all we need is just to displace the wave slightly to the left, okay, the direction of motion. So let's say if I allow the wave to move, okay, so it will be moving this way. So it will be moving in wrong color. So it will be moving in this direction. Okay, so which means I, I can safely say that the black one is the original. Okay, so maybe I look at it and let's say one second later. Okay, so this is let's say original, it will be time at zero second. So maybe I look at it in one second later, time one second later. Okay, the next instance. Okay, the next instant you'll find that the red color wave will be the mode, will be the next instant, the wave, the shape of the wave in the next instant. Now, if you compare the two waves, you will find that since the particle has to be at the this location, they are not moving, they are only vibrating up and down. You'll find that okay, the particle originally is at this position here. This is the original position. Now at the new wave, at the new wave, the red color one, and one second later, the red color one, the same particle is actually appearing here. Okay, the same particle actually has dropped down. So in this case, by drawing the wave in the next instance, okay, by comparing after that, then you compare the two waves, the time one and time zero second, you will find that you will be able to identify the movement of the particle itself. For example, in this case, at time zero, this is the black one, the black wave. Okay. Then after that, at time 
one second later, the particle is red color one, which means it has actually moved, the particle has moved down. Okay, so straight away, you will know that, okay, because of the motion of the wave, when the wave moves to the left, particle actually move downwards. So that's why the answer here is actually D. Okay, in the next instant, it will be actually moving downwards. Okay, so this is a technique for identifying the particle motions, okay, uh, pertaining to transverse wave. So similarly, if the wave is going to the right, okay, you just draw your wave slightly displaced to the right. Then after that, you compare the motion, the location of the particle, then you'll be able to identify the motion of the particle already. Now for 13, okay, 13, take note, okay, EM wave spectrum, all these things, okay, increasing order of magnitudes, okay, this one I mentioned a lot of time already, for EM wave, okay, it's important to identify all the waves, to know all the waves in terms of the uh, arrangement, in terms of frequency and in terms of wavelength. So this one, question 30, I will not dwell too much, okay, but take note, okay, remember the location, okay, because it's utmost important. It's quite a common question if you look at EM wave. Other than the location, the other aspect I would like to test would be the uh, users of the EM wave, different components of the EM waves. Now, uh, let, this is what I mentioned, the user EM waves. Okay, the user EM wave, same thing, you will need to know infrared is a commonly used in where remote control, okay, uh, in, used in remote control. So, as a, example, if, then what are, then after what are, which of the following is not a possible use of infrared uh, radiation, you will know counterfeit forgery, counterfeit, uh, counterfeit detector, okay, is what we call detection of forgery, it is not used in infrared. Yeah, I'm not going to burn the notes uh, or, or the dollar notes. What, what happened is for forgery detector, we, we are actually looking at using, okay, is using UV ray, okay, to look at the, the special ink that is printed on the notes, okay, the, the light that we are going to, uh, the, the ray that we are going to use, it has to be in ultraviolet, not infrared. Now, two men is standing at the two cliffs. Okay, he clapped his hand once, uh, but he hear two echo, one followed by another one. Okay, first thing first is how do you identify the two echo? Okay, the two echo here, this is what it means. So at, at the beginning when I clap, okay, the, this is the sound is being emitted. So the first wave will actually, there will be wave coming up from the clap. So the wave will actually be moving to the right. Okay, some wave will be moving to the left. Okay, so what happened is for the wave that's moving to the right side one, 150, the blue color one, he will actually be traveling 150 meter. It hits the cliff two, he will bounce back. After that, he will actually go past the guy, the man again. Okay, after traveling 150 meter to the right and then 150 meter to the left. At the same instance, okay, while the first, the blue color wave, the sound wave travel to the right on the blue color track, yeah, the Sound wave will also be going to the left using the purple uh, purple color one, following the purple color track. So you will move to cliff one. After that, when you hit cliff one, he will reflect and go back to the man again. Okay, so this purple color one, this second echo will actually travel a distance of 300 meter, followed by another 300 meter. Okay. So if you look at the distance, if you look at the distance travel, okay, by the first echo one, number one, the first echo travel a total of 150 plus 150. So this will be 300 meter. Okay, this is echo number one. Echo number two. He actually travel a distance of 300 meter. Back again, 300 meter. So you have a total of 600 meter. Okay, so from here you can identify, okay, Given that the speed of sound is 300 meter per second, 300 meter per second, echo one, okay, speed of sound, okay, speed is distance divided by time. Okay, so you'll find that if, if I traverse 300 meter now, okay, using the speed 300 meter per second, the time taken for echo one, it actually is one second. Okay. So now you look at your echo two, okay? Echo two, okay? For him to travel 600 meter, echo two for the speed of 300 meter per second, echo two actually takes two seconds, okay? To reach the man. 
echo one will reach will need one second, echo two will need two seconds. So the difference between them is the time difference between the two interval will be time difference will be two seconds minus one second, you will give you 1.0 seconds. So the interval between the two echo will be heard, okay, will be one second interval. So after one second, the second echo will arrive. Okay, here what we're looking is how the technique that I use is I actually trace the distance move by the echo itself, okay, by the sound wave itself to create the first echo and the sound wave to create the power of the sound wave to create the second echo. Then from there, I can work out the time taken for echo one and echo two. Uh, 16, okay, 16 is the uh, variable resistor. Okay, it's a standard example of like uh, the use of the, uh, the, the uh, different components. Now, variable resistor, like the name suggests, is to vary the resistor. Okay, to vary the resistance. So the vary, varying the resistance by changing the resistance, what will be affected? Definitely this component. I resist something, I resist current. So that's what I mean by resistor. So if I change the resistor, I will be actually changing the current flowing through the circuit, which is A. Now the formula number 17, cross-sectional area. So the formula that we are looking at will be uh, R equal to rho L over A. So A, A, will be the, A will be the area, L will be the length of the material, rho will be the type of material. Okay, so if I'm using the same type of material, okay, the density, uh, the resistivity, okay, will not be affected. So they will be the same uh, resistivity. Now what happened is, which of the wire will have a resistance of 5 ohm? Okay, now, originally it is 5 ohm. Okay, it already is 5 ohm with a resistance of 0.6 and uh, with a cross-sectional, with a length of 0.6 and with a area, uh, area of point, uh, 0.4. So I can simply say, if you look at the ratio, okay, with a five ohm resistance, with a five ohm resistance, okay, the ratio of length over area is zero point six and zero point four. So if you look at the ratio here, you'll be three over two, which is one over one point five. So the ratio of length over area is one point five. Okay, so which means I can safely say that for the for five ohm resistor, the ratio of length and area has to be five one point five. Okay, so the easiest I would say the most straightforward way is to identify which of the option given actually give me the same ratio. Okay, if I have the same ratio, I will be I will be able to I will be able to command the same resistance value of five ohm. So here what we do is I will start another column. I will start another column here. So what I do is I will identify what's the ratio between L over A, uh, the ratio of L and A. Okay, let me write nicely a bit. Okay, so I will find the ratio of L divided by A. So among all these, you'll find if you look at the ratio, let's say 0.3 over 0.4, in this case, this ratio is 0 0.75. Okay, same thing, you, uh, you look at the ratio for each of them, you work out the answer one of them, each of them. You will find that C will give you this ratio that has the same as the previous one, which is 1.5. Okay, 1.2 divided by 0.8. If you reduce it, it will be what we know as your ratio 1 is to 5. Okay, sorry, 1.5, 1 to 5. 3 is to 2, 1.5. So the ratio will be 3 is to 2, or what we call 1.5. So with the same ratio C, you'll find that wire C will actually have the same resistance value because they have the same ratio in terms of length and cross-sectional area. Okay, here what we do is I'm looking at using the basic formula for resistance to identify the formula. So it's utmost important to actually know what is the formula for this resistance. This formula, okay, R equal to rho L over A. Okay, you have to know this formula in order to solve it. Huh? Now for parallel circuit, same thing. Okay, what's the current flowing through the three one of the three ohm resistor? One na nah, one na, nah. not all the current. Not not. Uh, sometimes the question will be asking for all the current. Okay, sometimes the question will be asking for current in the branch. Okay, so in this case, I'm looking for the current in the branch here. So the most e the easiest one will be using ohm's law because it's parallel. It will means that six volt here. It will means that each of the branch will be three volts and three volts ready. Okay, so if I know that the potential difference across each resistor is three volts, 
and the resistance value of the resistor is 3 ohms. I'll be able to identify the current flowing through each of the resistor will be. Okay, so give me, this is 6 ohm, my mistake. This will be 6 volts, okay, and the resistance value is 3 ohm. So you'll find that the current flowing through each of the resistor will be actually 2.0 ohm. Okay, answer A. Uh, answer C, sorry, my mistake. Okay. So take note of your uh, question. Remember, this type of question usually they will ask for the current flowing in one resistor or even the current flowing out of the battery. So it depends on what the question is asking for. If they're asking for current in a resistor, flowing across a resistor, it will be 2M. Okay, but the current flowing from the battery, it will be 4M. Okay, so note what the question is asking. Okay, same thing. The uh, another basic formula that we'll be looking at is current is equal to charge flow per unit time, Q over T. Why do I need this formula? Is because the question asks for charge. Okay, so ask for charge. The easiest way, if you look at it, is to use the current formula Q equal to I T. So if I want to find charge, I definitely need time, uh, current, and time. Time, I know already, time given in the question is four seconds. So what is the current that is needed? So before you identify current, there's one formula you must know also. 24 watts, 12 volts. So 24 watts is what we know as power. So you have this formula for P equal to IV. So if it's 24 watts, the current is unknown, but I know the voltage is 12, 12 volts. So I will know that the current, if you work on the math, it will be 2M. So once I have 2M, I will actually substitute it into the previous equation here. So in total, 2 times 4, it will be 8 coulomb for the charge. So answer here will be C. Ah, so it will be D. Okay, 8 coulomb. Okay. Uh, question 20, the last MCQ paper. Okay, which of the fuse is connected correctly? Remember, fuse, when we talk about fuse, switch. Okay. These are the components that you must mention. It must always be connected at the live cable for it to be used effectively. So to identify the location of the fuse, just make sure it's connected on the live wire. Okay, so on the live wire here, you will see that straight away on the live wire, on the live wire is only option A. Okay, the fuse is on the live wire and straight away you will choose the answer already. Okay, because fuse, on the fuse, uh, fuse switches, all these components are, has to be used place on the uh, on the live wire to be to be effectively used okay to be to be used correctly okay so with that we will move on to to your paper two okay question one okay paper two okay question one okay okay question one we look at the kinematics velocity time graph remember when you look at kinematics there are a few things that we want to take note before we start doing the question now for speed time graph the first thing you do is Remember the look at the time axis. Make sure, make sure where okay, the time axis here is in terms of seconds. Because well, sometimes because I will need you to do some calculation. And most of the time when you look at the calculation versus the speed time graph in meter per second, the time has to be in seconds. So that the calc any calculation, any formula that you use, okay, the numbers will be uh, calculated correctly, will be in the correct magnitude. If which means that if the timing is in minutes or hour, okay, make sure you have a habit to convert it to seconds later on. The second thing that we want to take note is actually the uh, gradient of the graph. The gradient of the, uh, the gradient of the graph that we're looking at, because one thing for speed time graph is that the gradient of the graph will give us the acceleration of the object. Okay, so this is the first uh, second thing that we look at. This other component that we look at will be the area under the graph. Okay, the area under the graph, whichever is the time interval. The area under the graph, it will give us one thing. Okay, the area under the graph will give us the distance traveled by the object. So if you distance travel. So if you look at velocity time graph, the, 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 the users of uh, velocity time graph is to make sure, okay, this technique to use it is to make sure that the axis is correct. After you look at the gradient, yeah, after you look at the area under the graph, these are the what we call the logical steps in analyzing the velocity time graph. Okay, so we are, so once you have done that, okay, then you are ready to actually look at the question to solve the question. Okay, uh, question one, I will not draw too much definition. Okay. Now, uh, weight of the object, weight of the object, the standard formula, same thing, W equal mg. Okay, this is the formula. I will, uh, same thing, I don't think there's a problem. Okay, uh, describe what happened to the 
uh, speed of the rock during the first two seconds. Now, when we look at description here, right, we are looking at describing the acceleration. Okay, so, uh, equivalent component of the acceleration. So you need to, if you look at, if you want to write, you write your answer in terms of speed, you have to tell me, tell the marker how the speed is changing with respect to time. So that's why, okay, you will find the answer could be what increasing, decreasing, what at, at a certain rate, all these things. So it has to be a breakdown of the uh, accelerations. Okay, so you cannot just tell me all oh, the speed increase and the, as time increases, you cannot tell me this. Okay, because when you talk about description, you have to tell me how the time, how the speed changes with respect to time, or AKA to describe the acceleration to the marker itself. Now, so now let's take a look. Okay, now when at the first two seconds, you'll find that. Okay, if you look at the gradient of the line, the gradient of the, the gradient of the graph at the first two seconds, you look at the first two seconds here. So the gradient of the line is actually, this is the line, the straight line. But as you move on, okay, you find that the line is actually getting gentler and gentler. The gradient is actually getting gentler and gentler. Okay, the tension of the line or the gradient of the line is getting gentler and gentler. Which means that, okay, once you identify the gradient to be gentler, okay, it will also mean that the acceleration of the graph is actually getting smaller and smaller. When we talk about gradient is getting gentler and gentler, it will mean that the gradient value is actually decreasing. And in other words, it also means that it will tell us that the acceleration of the graph is actually decreasing. For decreasing acceleration, the, the, okay, for decreasing acceleration, it also means that the speed is actually increasing at decreasing rates. Okay, but it is still accelerating, but it's just that it's accelerating at a slower rate, smaller rate every time. Okay, or AKA acceleration. So if you don't want to write increasing at this uh, decreasing rate, you can, you can just replace it with the acceleration is decreasing. Okay, you will mean the same thing also. So both answers are accepted. Then after that, same thing, the distance of the rod between two to five seconds, same thing, two to five seconds is this interval. When I want to, when I want to look at the distance between these two interval is AK, I'm telling you to look at the area under the graph, which is this particular rectangle. Okay, so if you look at this particular rectangle, you will find that, okay, I'm looking for the area of this rectangle. And you, once you got the area, the length and breadth, you will get the distance of the travel, which is 36 meter. Okay, remember area and the graph represent distance. Okay, then after that, we look at the, we, we will look at the moments. Okay, the pivot is at X. Okay, there are two forces looking at the question. One is the width, okay, which is a Newton. Huh? Then the other one is force. Okay. Now, if you look at the question, you'll find that for four, for eight Newton weights, okay, you'll find that is we will create a clockwise moment. Let me label it M8. But angle distance is actually from the pivot to the force itself. Okay, so this is your perpendicular distance D8. Okay, so before I start on moment question, before I start on the moment equation, I actually prepare, I will actually want to prepare all the components of moments. Okay, why what what Component am I talking about for moments? Moment is considered is the product of force and the perpendicular distance okay, measured from the pivot to the force itself. So before I look at any calculations, before I do any calculation, I want to make sure I know where are the variables. I want to be able to identify where are the force and what is the respective perpendicular distance. Same thing if I look at F. Okay, F is here, this is the force. With respect to the pivot, the moment that is going to create is going to be an anti-clockwise moment, which is M. I'll label this M F. And we look at if this is a moment, okay, this perpendicular distance of the force will be from the pivot to the force itself. This distance will be what we know as your D perpendicular. I'll label it as D F. Huh? Okay. Now, based on the question, based on the information, this is an important information, uniform ruler. Okay, CG is a uniform ruler, so which means automatically I know that actually CG A Newton, the four A Newton is actually at the middle of the ruler. So which means this is actually, D8 is actually 50 cm, half of the ruler. And based on the question, I know that, okay, the F, force F is at 85 cm mark. Okay, 85 cm mark, which indirectly tell me that DF 
is actually 85 cm. Okay, so now once I have all the components ready, I am ready to actually look at the question, solve it in terms of doing the calculation for turning effect. Okay, now, so calculate the force F. So turning effect, so same thing. If you look at principle of moment, you'll find that the clockwise moment, the clockwise moment, they will be equal to the anti-clockwise moment. Okay, so the anti-clockwise the anti-clockwise moment okay will be f times zero point eight five like I mentioned f point times zero point eight five f times df will be zero point eight five which is here. Clockwise moment will be clockwise moment will be the a newton multiplied by the perpendicular distance which is fifty cm. Okay, zero point eight five. So once you put in the uh values, you look at algebra, you'll be uh, able to calculate the force F will be 4.71 Newton. The okay, answer has to be 2 or in 3 SF. Huh? Now explain whether there will be any work done by the force F. Okay, work done. Okay, work done. Remember, work done. When you talk about work done, it has the force and the distance. It has to be in the same axis. Okay, same axis, huh? what we call parallel. Okay. And since if you look at the mo you look at the force, okay, if you look at rotation, this object is rotating. Okay, the ruler is rotating, which means the direction will never be in the same direction one. So that's why I can actually safely conclude that the work done, okay, by force F, there will not be any work done because the distance move in the same axis, the same direction as force F is actually zero. Okay, so that's why with no distance, the distance move. Okay, it's not in the same axis, and because of that, the work done will actually be zero. Okay, because why? Because by definition, work done is the product of the distance in a eh, work done is the work done is the distance move in the direction of the force. Huh? So I will definitely need the distance to be in the same direction. Now for question three on waves, okay. Now describe how the string causes the sound. Okay, when we talk about sound, how sound is produced. Okay, yeah, uh, I would say it's a standard uh it, I always tell my students to, to write in a standard format whereby you it actually tell us to, it, will, it will actually tell the marker to say uh first thing I will write I want one to tell I want to tell the marker how the molecule move with respect to the wave motion. Or aka I will actually be just using the definition of longitudinal wave okay as my starting point. So I will tell the marker or oh, the string particle or the air particle is actually moving in the same directions or in parallel in parallel to the wave motion that's what we mean by definition and this is what this first statement is trying to tell you okay the first statement will tell you uh, okay how the wave particle move with respect to the wave motion aka definition of the longitudinal wave second thing i also will tell the marker is that because of the motion it actually create a series of refraction and compression okay so this is the second thing i want to tell the marker the series of refraction and compression okay this is like what i mentioned here and so we and the couple and the combination of these two things once i create a series of refraction compressions okay, and the sound particle moving in the correct format in correct direction these two will actually allow sounds to be created sound to be transmitted from point a to point b okay and this is how i will actually write uh, my answer when looking at how sound is transmitted how sound is created we okay, always want to always include the definition of longitudinal wave followed by a last statement to see how sound is created okay by a series of refraction and trans uh, compression what happens when amplitude increase like i mentioned the mcq okay amplitude increase the sound get louder okay if i have the pitch okay same thing pitch if i have the frequency increase my pitch will increase so these are the two things you have to remember. Uh, question four, uh, particle electricity, the three beam plug. Okay, three beam plug, first thing you take a look is, remember, first thing, the most obvious one is to actually look at the color of the cable. Okay, the color of cable, the color of cable, remember, uh, blue and brown. Okay, you must know where are the cables. Okay, blue, uh, the blue should actually be, blue should actually, Blue should actually be on the blue should actually be on the neutral, huh? so the brown should be on the live. Huh? Okay, so now same thing. Okay, let's look at the question first. Now part C, uh, part S, that's the fuse. This is the fuse rating. Uh, this is the fuse. Sorry, then we state one way in which the uh the plug is arranged wrongly. Okay, is in terms of the wiring. Okay, the brown wire is actually what we know as your live wire. Okay, 
the blue color one should actually be your neutral wire. Okay, so the location of the wire actually swap. Huh? Okay, now the location of the wire is actually important because like I mentioned before in the MCQ, uh, the location of the cable, the live cable, it actually tell us if I know if I know where's the live cable, I, that's where the location where I put my fuse and my switch. Well, switch and fuse has to be in the live cable for it to work properly. So even though when you look at the question here, uh, okay, the cable here has been swapped in the wrong location. But it actually doesn't affect how whether the appliances can work. You know? It doesn't affect you switch on the appliances will work. Okay, because current they are just wires uh, current will actually flow from uh, the uh, positive terminal to the negative terminal. Okay, the cable was the appliances will still work. But what is a hazard is because right now, because of the wrong cabling, my casing uh, my earth wire, my my fuse, okay. My fuse, okay, will not okay, will not be working in the correct manner. Because in this case, right, you'll find that now my fuse, okay, is placed at the live cable. But my live cable is actually the what we call the neutral cable, which is the wrong position. Huh? My life, for this switch, the live cable is actually the neutral cable. So because my life, my fuse is at the neutral cable now. Okay, so which if I switch off right, my appliances are, will still be high voltage one. My appliances will still be connected to the high voltage mine, which means the moment, even though with the switch you switch off, if I touch the if I touch the casing, yes, I touch the casing. If I touch the appliances, okay, if I touch the bare wire, okay, the current will still flow from the positive terminal, will flow from the positive terminal of the switch, it will flow through the appliances and it will flow down to me again. Okay, because the fuse is at the wrong position. You, the fuse is placed at the neutral and neutral cause will cause the appliances to be at a high voltage. So that's why even when it switch off, okay, the oven will still be live. Okay? So that's why it's very dangerous. It will still cause current to flow out from the switch. Okay, so please be careful okay, in terms of the uh, location, the placement of the fuse, placement of the switch is a small devices, but at placing in the correct location to make sure it works, it will actually save lives. Okay? So please take note of your circuits. Now, section B, same thing. Okay, remember, choose the correct questions. Okay, Three questions, choose two. Huh? Now, so we will look at the setting here. Now, where the guy is, the archer, archer is, shooting the bow upwards. Okay, state one force that allows, that have one effect the force has on the motion of the uh, body or what we call the effects of forces on the body. Uh, I will say this is quite simple. So it's a lower set question or a primary school question that we always use. So any questions, any answer will, will, will actually be suffice. Okay, it will be enough. Now, free body diagram of the arrow just before it's being released. Uh, just before it's being released. Okay, just before it's being released means, right, there is a stretching force. So which means, just before it release, okay, you'll find that the arrow, okay, the force of the man, okay, the hand or, or the hand uh, is actually pulling the arrow backwards or downwards. So we should you have a downward arrow here. Okay, this will be the force by the man. Okay. Then after that, similarly, you will have the weight of the arrow, which is also downwards. Okay, the weight of the arrow. So you have two forces. So you have the weight of the arrow. Okay, these are two forces that's completely downwards. And at the same point, right, you'll find that the arrow is actually resting on the string. The arrow is resting on the string. Okay, the arrow is resting on the string. So between the arrow is resting on the string, it also means that let's say this is a string. So the arrow will be resting here. Okay, it will be resting on the string. So the arrow will be pushing the string. Okay, and similarly, the string will also be pushing on back onto the arrow by Newton's third law. So that's why I will have a upward force. Okay, this is the force of the string on the arrow itself. So in total, I actually have three forces acting on the string just before I release. Huh? So that's why you have to be careful. Most of us we tend to miss out okay, the stretch, the string. Maybe because we forgot that there is actually a string beneath the arrow. The arrow is actually sitting on the string itself. Okay, now the arrow pull back a distance of 0.4 meter and the force given is 150 Newton. So I want to calculate the force, the work done. Okay, I will sim it's a simple equation. Force times distance move in the direction of the force. Okay, so we have 150 times 0.4, it will be 60 joules. 
Okay, in reality, the question is not about cons conservation of energy. It's eighty percent up. It's converted. Is okay. The energy transfer to the arrow is eighty percent. Okay, so what is the speed of the uh, arrow? So which means the forces here. Okay, which means whatever work done I have at the beginning. Okay, eighty percent of this is actually converted to kinetic energy. Okay, because the based on the question is it's not hundred percent. It's not a it's not an ideal situation. So there will be some losses. So eighty percent will be converted. So eighty percent converted. Okay, after that the formula half mv squared. Eighty percent of sixty joules. Okay, if you look at algebra, you'll be then you'll be able to calculate the speed to be twenty one point nine meter per second. Okay, now state how the state how state how the conservation can be used to explain only eighty percent. Okay, of the energy is being converted, like I mentioned before, because it's not ideal, which means some of the energy has actually been converted to other form of energy. So, which means I have 100% here, okay, it's converted to 80% in terms of kinetic energy. So, the remaining 20%, it will be converted to where it could be sound energy, it could be thermal energy due to friction. Okay, so this is why I mean by although the conservation of energy is 80%, okay. But the other 20% is once you accounted the 20% into your system, the conservation of energy still will still be valid. Energy will still be conserved. It's just that it's converted from one form to two forms. Okay, with three forms. Are, okay, so that's what I mean by conservation of energy does work. Okay, it's just that we must factor in all the conversion. Now, question six here. Here we look at the temperature versus time graph. I would say it would be the cooling curve. Okay. Now here we have two tins, uh, two cans, okay, filled with the same amount of hot liquid, uh, same amount of hot liquid at the same temperature. Okay. Now room temperature is 25 degrees. Okay. One of the can is black on the surface, one of them is polished on the surface. So literally I have two cans. Okay. So let's say I have a can A and can B. Uh. So can A is dark. Okay. Then after that, can be is the polished surface. Okay, so they are filled with the same amount of liquid. So this is temperature of the liquid, temperature of the liquid. Okay, same amount of liquid, same temperature. I would say the only difference here is like the, the container. Okay, now explain from the explain the graph from the graph here. Okay, the using a graph, why the net flow of heat out of the whether there's a net flow of heat out of the hot liquid okay now let's look at how we use the graph remember the based on the question is from the graph so you need to make reference to the graph now based on the question based on the graph from the graph you find that the temperature is actually dropping okay, the temperature is actually dropping okay from the beginning whereby it's a liquid the temperature actually start to drop 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 all the way down to 25 uh, 70 degree then after it starts to then after that it starts to actually uh freezes okay then after that it continues to drop again now why net flow of thermal energy out okay how do we see from the graph one of the most obvious one is because the temperature of the graph is actually dropping okay and the other perspective is because we know that the liquid is hot okay the outside external environment is actually what we know as the colder and okay, get the colder temperature and when you have a difference in temperature, your heat flow or heat transfer is always from a direction whereby it's hot to cold. Because once you have a temperature gradient, now once you have a temperature difference, energy will start to flow and it's always flowing in the direction whereby it's going from hot to cold. So how do we know there's a net flow of energy out of the, out of, out of the liquid? It's primarily because first thing first is that there is a temperature, the hot temperature, is actually decreasing okay and once you know that the hot temperature is decreasing means which means the energy must flow from somewhere and it flow out of the liquid and it must flow somewhere and that somewhere is actually the environment and because the energy actually flow out the thermal energy actually flow out of the liquid okay and thus i will be able to identify okay the temperature of the liquid actually drops so because of the temperature drops I will be able, I will be able to deduce that the, the term, there's a net flow of energy from the liquid out to the environment. So that, that's the evidence for me to tell to, to let me to inform me that the, there's a net flow out of the system.
Okay, or what we can we can actually say in a, a more elegant way to, to say that the, there's a net flow of temperature because why there's a temperature differences okay, between the environment and the can itself or aka what we know as the basic uh, definition or the basic condition for net flow of thermal energy. Thermal energy only flows okay, when there is a difference in temperature, when there's a temperature gradient. Okay, so you always flow from very hot to cold. Now, what happened to the liquid when the when the temperature changes from A to B? So when you look at A to B, A to B here is actually cooling down. A to B is cooling down, molecular level cooling down. We talk about cooling down is what we call temperature decrease. Okay, so A to B, the most obvious one is what we call temperature decrease. So when you look at temperature decrease, first thing you look at is actually the internal kinetic energy. Okay, so in terms of molecular level, it will definitely means that the temperature decrease, it will definitely mean that the kinetic energy of the particle actually become okay, the energy, the energy particle, the kinetic energy will actually be decreasing. And thus, I will also be able to use that because my kinetic energy decreases, the average speed of the molecule will also be slower. Okay, because temperature is tagged directly to uh, kinetic energy and kinetic energy is tagged directly to velocity. So I can actually do a few steps of inference to deduce what happens to the liquid, what happens to the molecules as it cools down. Okay, so this is what, what we mean by different steps of analysis. So you must know what you're looking for. Okay, and the most important thing is because I know that temperature, if you look at thermal property of the liquid, thermal property of liquid, when we talk about temperature, we always pack it directly to kinetic energy and the velocity of the molecules. Part C, kinetic model, what happens when the liquid is freezing? Now, when you look at kinetic uh, liquid is freezing, okay, what keywords to use, what energy to describe? Okay, I mentioned it in my chapter 9, I think chapter 9, thermal property, that particular topic, that particular video on boiling, cooling, and condensing. Okay, we talk about what happened to the internal energy, what happened to the kinetic energy, what happened to the potential energy, and what are the respective changes. Okay, you have forgotten or you have not revised on the thermal property, I will, I will leave the link to that video for chapter 9, thermal property, in the description panel below. Okay, and the uh, video link will be on the top right-hand corner, so on this top right-hand corner, so you might want to take a look at the video to do a quick refresher. So, but if you have done it, you make sure you have to check the answer, make sure you actually write down the correct keywords. Okay, when you talk about freezing, when you talk about freezing, and the change in state, you have to tell the marker, you have to inform the marker that there is actually a change in the intermolecular bonds. Okay, so in this case, it will be increased the strengthening or increase of intermolecular bonds or strengthen the intermolecular bonds. And after that, you have to draw references to the first energy. Increased molecular bond, it will mean that potential energy is being given out as it changed state from liquid to uh, liquid to solid. So in this case, the first thing that we always talk, uh, we always need the students to tell me is actually in terms of potential energy. And in terms of potential energy, the tagging keyword you have to tell the marker is to tell, to explain what happened to the intermolecular forces. And after that, the second thing is what happened to the change in state. Okay, these are the two keywords that we have to write. After that, not just internal potential energy. Other than that, okay, when we talk about internal potential energy, there's one other energy we have to tell them because in internal energy consists of potential energy and kinetic energy. So in this perspective here, you have to tell me my kinetic energy, what happened to it? Okay, because my potential energy is changing. All the energy has been diverted. All the energy is coming from the potential energy. So as a result, my kinetic energy actually remains constant. Okay, actually remain constant. Okay, my internal energy remain constant. And what is the outcome that I can see is as, as a result, the temperature of the object during the temperature of the liquid during freezing actually remains constant. So these are the tagging keyword that I will want to write for my uh, for, for this particular stage when you are freezing. All these keywords actually have been mentioned. Uh, I have actually mentioned them in during the topic when we are when I go through the topic thermal property. Okay, so remember to get a quick look at the table that I summarize. Okay, to look at all the uh, necessary keywords. Okay, so don't miss that. As in the keyword is quite standard. The tagging keyword energy is uh, energy is packed with temperature. All these tagging are actually uh, fixed. Uh, it's a fixed tagging, uh, I would say. So when you write, so remember to write them down. Don't miss out anything. Now on the uh, after that, look at the uh, dark, uh, the black the black 
draw the cooling curve for the black can. Okay, now black can, remember, uh, black can here, we look at radiations. Okay, black can, it has to, it will radiate faster, it will cool down faster. But one of the things that we have to take note is that, okay, although it, it, it cool down faster, although it black, okay, is a good radiation. So eventually all the, all the temperature drop, the temperature drops, okay, it will be faster. But there's a few things that we need to take note is that although it drops, it's faster, the temperature drop is faster, the freezing point will still remain the same because we are looking at the same liquid. So the freezing point for the black can will still be 70 degrees. The only difference is that it actually hit, hit reach 70 degrees faster, like what is mentioned in this, uh, this picture here. It reached 70 degrees faster. And same thing, it actually cooled down faster, it actually freezes faster, okay, because it's being black. We're okay, bringing a good uh, emitter. So it actually freeze faster. After that, it starts to decrease again. Okay, and same thing, it would actually decrease at a faster rate as compared to the uh, compared to the white can or the silver can. Okay, so although things I want to highlight again, although it has a shorter line, although the line the for the black one, it has a temperature drop is actually faster. The temperature drop is actually faster, but take note the freezing point is still the same. So the freezing point is still the same. So the freezing point is still the same. It is still 70 degrees Celsius. Okay, so take note of it because it is still the same liquid. Okay, so with that, okay, then we will hit uh, the second question completed. So now we move on to the third question. The okay, third question here is a circuit question. Okay, you have two resistor, two ohm resistor in parallel. This is where we are in parallel, are parallel. After that, in series, and these two of them is actually in series with the three ohm resistor. Okay, so same thing. Uh, first thing first is how we label a voltmeter to measure potential difference of three ohm resistor. Oh, easy. Okay, voltmeter. Most of us must know and should know is it has to be connected in parallel. So if I want the three ohm resistor, all I need to do is just connect it across the three ohm resistor. Label it V. After that, I will get my answer straight away. Okay, 3 ohm resistor, uh, the potential difference of the 3 ohm, so the voltmeter must be above 3 ohm resistor. Okay, now when the switch is open, the potential difference between the 2 ohm is, i uh, calculate the potential difference, okay, given that the current is 4 amp. Now when the switch is open, now take note of it, okay, when the switch is open, when the switch is open, this branch here is inactive. It is open circuit. This branch is inactive. So within this branch is effectively dead. Okay, I can just ignore it. So within at this particular part B, when the switch is on, when the switch, sorry, when the switch is open, okay, this circuit, the resistor I'm looking at is actually the 3 ohm resistor followed by the 2 ohm resistor connected to the battery here. Okay, and the current is happened to be here in the circuit. This is the current. Well, so if you look at this branch now, when the switch is open, it's actually 3 ohm and 2 ohm in series. Okay, 3 ohm and 2 ohm in series. And we know that the current that is flowing through is actually the current that's flowing through the, the emitter, which is here, is actually 4 ohm. Okay, so if I want to know the potential difference across 2 ohm, oh, 2 ohm resistor, which is here, the potential difference. All right, potential difference, we can use VIR, which is Ohm's law. I want to know the potential difference of the two ohm resistor. I will need to know the resistance of the resistor and I will need to know the current across the resistor. And based on the question, the current is four M. The resistance value, resistance value is two ohms, four times two, answer eight straight away. So I will know that at this particular arrangement, this voltage is actually eight volts. Okay, now when the switch is closed, okay, calculate the current flowing through the emitter. When the switch is closed, okay, it is this circuit now. When the switch is closed, it's effectively what we what uh what I mentioned earlier is actually a parallel resistance R parallel in series with your three ohm resistor. So effectively, if you look at it, okay, you can actually rearrange the circuit to be this way. my three ohm resistor in series with the R parallel. Okay, and the series and these of them are in series. Okay, and this is what we call your R total. Okay, 
So true enough. So what do I do? Okay, first thing first, I want to calculate the current flowing through the emitter. Okay, I want to calculate when everything the switch is short. I want to calculate the current flowing the emitter. AKA is I want to calculate the current flowing in the from the battery. Okay, so to calculate the current flowing in the battery. So the easiest one from the battery is I need I total, V total, I'm sorry, R total. And I need the total potential difference. In this case, it's quite straightforward because the total potential difference here, oops, sorry. The total potential difference is actually what we know as the EMF, which is 20 volts. But what we are lagging now is the total resistance. So now before I can identify the total current, okay, which is what the question need, okay, I need to calculate what is the total resistor first. So that's why I look at the total resistor. So first thing first, calculate R parallel first. So this is the formula for R parallel. Then after that, like I mentioned before, three ohms and R parallels in series. So you can add them together. Total resistance will be four ohm. Okay, so this one will be 4 ohms. So now your RT is 4 ohms. Okay, after that, you substitute the value. Okay, 20 divided by 4, answer will be 5 m straight away. Okay, so if you look at the circuit, I will not say this circuit is uh, difficult. It's just that it's a bit of tricky, especially the part whereby you calculate the resistance for parallel. Okay, remember the formula for parallel is 1 over R parallel. Okay, 1 over R, 1 over R. Well, 1 over R1 and 1 over R2. Remember, when you use the formula R over R parallel, example equal to uh, 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. Okay, this is the formula. Remember, at the there's one stage here whereby 1 over R parallel is equal to a number. This stage here, remember, okay, you have to flip the number. Remember to flip the fraction, okay, because ultimately, you are looking for R parallel not one over R parallel. Okay, remember the working, please be careful. Huh? Okay, if you, have, if you have forgotten about this, you can refer back to the circuit uh, video that I ma uh, make, uh, in particular to the parallel arrangement. After you can take a look at the video to do a quick refresher course. Now, stay, we stay with calculation, okay, whether the power dissipated by the three ohm is larger than the, uh, is larger, okay, as compared to the switch, when switch is closed. So they say with calculation, huh? Okay, so now let's look at the calculation. Heat loss will be pi square r will be the easiest. Okay, now take a look. Now for the three ohm resistor, okay, p equal s i square r. Okay, you can look at the power loss at the three ohm resistor. Okay, at the three ohm resistor. Now what happens? You let's compare when the switch is open. When the switch is open, take a look. Okay, at this arrangement. Okay, when the switch is open, okay, the current flowing through the three ohm resistor is four m. Huh? Okay, so that's why if you look at the power calculation, current is 4M. Okay, if you look at I square, you'll be able to calculate the power loss at when the switch open is 48 watts. Now, when the switch is closed, okay, when the switch is closed, okay, you'll find that based on the calculation, the current, the current flowing through when it's, it's closed, is this is the current. It's flowing through the 3 ohm, this is the current, or should I say this is the current, All right, which is what, what you calculated here. Okay, so the current flowing in the emitter is 5M when it's closed. So 5M, so this is where 5M, and you find that when it's switch is closed, the power dissipated, the current drawn by 3 ohm resistor is actually 5M, which is higher, which means the power drawn by the 3 ohm resistor when the switch is closed is actually much higher, which is 75 watts. Okay, so with calculation, you should be able to show effectively, uh, efficiently to say that the power dissipated in the three ohm resistor is actually much larger. Okay, so one thing to take note is whether you want to use, uh, for power calculation, whether you want to use P equal I square R, whether you want to use P equal IB, P equal V square over R, you will find that the power calculation is always, it will be the same. You will still calculate the uh, power at when the switch is open is 48 watts, when the switch is closed is still 75 watts. Okay, it's just that you need to get the respective voltage across the component. Okay, for example, if I want to calculate use V square over R, then I have to make sure that V, I need to get the potential difference across three ohms. Okay, then I can 
do the correct calculations, not just use 20 volts, uh, no. Uh. Okay, if I want to use V square over R, that potential difference has to be across three ohm only, not the total battery. Okay, now with this, okay, I have completed the three questions for section A, uh, section B, question uh, five, six, seven. If you look at the question, I will say that I will choose question five. Okay, I'm more confident to say that question five, I'm very confident to say that I, I will be able to get uh, most of the marks. Okay, or question six, I will be a bit, I will be a bit, I will be a bit uh, scared. Okay, if I use question six, because I will say that for me, A is quite, I would say it's, it's of a certain difficulty. I may not be, I may not be confident, 100% confident to get a full mark for A. Okay, to, to, when I want to explain net flow, because it's a question that's come up quite uh, unique, but it's something that I have not been done it if I'm the student. Okay, I may, if I see it for the first time, I may, I may miss out certain things. I may not be 100% confident that I have touched all the keywords that are needed. So question six, I would say 6A is one, is, is possible. Okay, I might have some difficulty in that. And maybe for part D, I may, for drawing a graph, I may not be 100% confident also. So if you look at, if you compare to seven, seven circuit, I would say this circuit, although the arrangement is a bit daunting, a bit scary, 20 volts, okay, four cells, okay, three resistor, although it's quite, uh, the, the picture is quite uh, daunting, but actually you look at the calculation and the type of question being asked in okay, this question seven is actually quite a standard question. Uh, it's quite a standard question. There's no new question here. I come back to question six. Okay, so if you compare question six and seven, if I were to make a choice as a student, I will actually choose question seven as the two question that is I'm going to answer. Okay, so with this, I hope, okay, I, I hope it, it, it drives the point to say that when you look at section B for your MC, uh, for your section B for your paper two, it's important to actually identify the two questions that will allow you to grab the most mark, put the most mark in your pocket. Not just the choose the question that you like or choose the question that you think is easy, okay, or you think is difficult, okay, or the, so it's important to actually not just compare the difficulty of the question, it's actually compare the question in terms of how many marks, how much marks you can get. Because section B is if you look at the calculation of the paper, section B actually has a significant weightage on your grades. Okay, because it's an eight mark question at section B, total is 16 marks. It's a big jump, basically. Okay, so choosing the correct grades, uh, correct question actually will help to push your grade, uh, your marks actually one grade up. Okay, if not, okay, this is where I end off. Okay, same thing, I will be uploading some videos along the way. If you want to get, uh, want to be notified of the video, okay, please remember to subscribe to the channel and actually, and to actually activate the bell button so that you'll be notified. Okay, and I hope that my future uh, videos and this video included, okay, will actually be of uh, some users to use, actually will help to make uh, your learning of physics or answering the questions uh, slightly better or slightly easier. Okay, if you have any questions, okay, just feel free to write, the, uh, leave the question at the comment bar below or drop me an email. Okay, if not, okay, this is where I end off. Okay, thank you everybody. See you.